Hello, everybody. My name is Ian McLaughlin, and I have a PhD in neuroscience. Um, and one of the biggest topics within this discipline for a very long time has been the pursuit of novel treatments for chronic pain, and really pain in general. And so the motivation for this is probably pretty obvious, but the reality is that we really don't have very many effective medications to help people who suffer from various kinds of pain. And this is particularly the case for people confronting chronic pain. And so the go-to class of medications to treat a huge variety of pain-associated conditions has been essentially the same for decades, opioids. And so you'll probably recognize some of these, um, you know, ones like codeine and morphine, which are, you know, natural in that they can just be directly extracted from the opium poppy. And so, so here you can see um, the opium poppy while it's blooming, uh, with some pretty beautiful flowers, by the way, as well as some um, seed pods, right, or a seed pod that forms after the petals fall off the flowers. And so um, in, the, in the picture with the sort of orb-like pod at the top, um, which forms, again, after the flower has bloomed, you can also see that, that sort of milky white sap, right, that's called latex, and it's basically just sap. Um, it's, you know, the sap that contains it's the sap from, you know, um, the opium poppy that contains all of these molecules, right, in including codeine and morphine, as well as the precursor molecule to some of the other uh, substances that you might recognize. So, for example, thebane um, is the precursor to, you know, an opioid molecule that's become pretty famous uh, for a variety of unfortunate reasons, oxycodone. While other opioids like hydrocodone and Vicodin, for example, is basically a modified codeine molecule. And, you know, because these undergo, you know, these kind of chemical modifications, these are considered to be semi-synthetic opioids. And then finally, there are the fully synthetic opioids that aren't derived from the opium poppy at all and are synthesized by chemists, which includes perhaps the most infamous opioid at this point, fentanyl, as well as opioids that, you know, are sometimes used to treat um, opioid addiction, like methadone. Okay. So there are a variety of opioids that um, are used recreationally and, and prescribed, and there's this whole world of gray market synthetic opioids <clears throat> that only exists via illicit trafficking. But that's the general landscape of these substances. Okay, so um, you know there are many opioids with slight differences in their you know molecular structures, right? But the reality is that they all do largely the same thing. They bind to receptors in our nervous system that are conveniently called opioid receptors. And <clears throat> I won't get into all of the neurobiology of the various opioid receptors, which is very interesting and complicated, but at least at this point, the main thing to recognize is that essentially all of these molecules here bind the same receptor, the mu opioid receptor. And so that's the reason that all these substances have fairly similar effects, right? They're all essentially binding the same receptor. Of course, you know, differences in their chemical structures translate to differences in how potent they are and how long their effects last, things like that. But more importantly for the topic today, those differences can also result in um, differences in their side effects. So opioids have a whole variety of side effects and, and some of them can be very interesting. You know, so for example, we know that opioids have substantial addictive you know, potential in some people. Not everyone, by the way. Uh, which is important to recognize, but in some people, right? Some of the stranger side effects, however, are things like causing a pretty substantial itchiness reaction. And in fact, you know, I've had people who, who you know, had recently started taking, you know, had, had been prescribed opioids, message me and ask if it's normal that they're so itchy or if they're having maybe an allergic reaction to the substance. And so, by the way, it turns out that they're not. Um, it's the interaction of these substances with a specific version of the mu opioid receptor that happens to cause that itchiness reaction. And so I actually have a link to uh, the paper that identified that, that process um, in the description section. And so <clears throat> one of the telltale signs that someone is using opioids is if they're sort of weirdly regularly itching their arms and their neck and their torso, just, just kind of everywhere, but without having any kind of like rash or obvious you know, allergic reaction um, on their skin. But another odd side effect that I regularly hear people actually get wrong is pupil constriction, okay, which you can see here. Um, and so this is literally a picture of, of someone experiencing pupil constriction called meiosis, by the way, via opioids. And so I regularly hear people say that opioids dilate the pupils, which is just wrong. They don't. <laughs> um, and so anyways, that's another telltale sign that someone's using opioids, um, which, by the way, happens to be much easier to detect in somebody, you know, who has like lovely green eyes um, or, or, you know, bright blue eyes. 
But anyway, so, so there are other side effects like, you know, severe constipation. Um, by the way, you might be interested to know that um, one of the main treatments for diarrhea is, guess what? An opioid, lopiramide, uh, or you might know it as Imodium. It's actually an opioid. It, it doesn't happen to have any significant psychoactive effects, in part because it doesn't really cross the blood-brain barrier very effectively. But it can, in fact, cause some substance dependence and even withdrawal symptoms after um, somebody's been using lopiramide for a long period of time. And I know some people have explored achieving psychoactive effects uh, with lopiramide via either like massive doses or combining with other things to help it, you know, theoretically get into the blood, uh, get beyond the blood brain barrier. But anyway, so opioids are well known to cause constipation. It can become a pretty significant problem for people who are being treated. Um, you know, for chronic pain with opioids. And so, okay, there are other things, um, other side effects like agitation. People can become just sort of like a bit more irritable. And, you know, there are other side effects, but, but arguably the single most unfortunate side effect of this entire family of drugs um, makes them both extremely dangerous and ultimately suboptimal medications, you know. And that side effect is their effects on respiration or breathing. So opioids induce respiratory depression and potentially failure, which basically means that it reduces the rate at which people breathe such that the gas exchange that occurs in our lungs is close to or beyond inadequate. And the consequences of that are the reason that people are lost to opioid overdose. People lose consciousness and ultimately stop breathing. And so even beyond the substance dependence that, that opioids induce, right, which is a critical problem, it is their effects on, on our breathing that, that really limit just how useful and, and how widely used opioids can, can reasonably be from the perspective of medicine. And so combined with the fact that people develop a tolerance to opioids fairly rapidly, you know, for someone who's being treated for chronic pain, there can be the need to escalate the dose of the prescribed opioid or perhaps substitute to more potent opioids to achieve sufficient pain management as time goes on. And, you know, opioids induce all these various effects and side effects. And tolerance, importantly, tolerance to each of these effects doesn't necessarily occur equivalently, right? And so this, you know, along with, with other, you know, issues with how some of the medications were initially marketed, which, by the way, is covered fabulously by Patrick Radden Keefe in The New Yorker. Um, this article is linked below. Uh, and Patrick Radden Keefe also came out with a book recently on the same topic. But these features of this family of substances have made finding an alternative to opioids one of the holy grails in, you know, neuropharmacology and drug development. And so, of course, you know, there's also the public health crisis that predated COVID-19, right? So, so the main, this figure up top isn't exclusively opioids. These are data from, you know, drug overdose fatalities in general. But if you look down here um, at, at how the relative contributions of various drugs that cause overdose fatalities breaks down, it's just abundantly clear that opioids, which is, that's the black line right there, um, and then synthetic opioids, which um, is that sort of um, uh, burnt orange kind of color. Um, and that does not include uh, methadone, by the way. Um, those two things account for the vast, vast majority of these fatalities, as well as a recent surge in fatalities. And so, I, you know, I do think it's worth acknowledging that methadone barely contributes to these statistics at all. It's that purple line along the bottom there. But anyways, in the most recent 12-month period for which the CDC has data, they're projecting around 90,000 people being lost. And so, we're now on the verge of reaching 100,000 people, you know, being lost to drug overdoses. And in case it's not clear, that surpasses the most recent record uh, number of, of individuals lost to drug overdose fatalities, which surpassed the prior record, which surpassed its prior record, and so on, right? We're losing the highest number of people to drug overdose fatalities in this country's history. And every month, it looks like that number is only rising. And so that specific public health crisis isn't the topic for, the, for today, but I did chat about what's wrong with what we're currently doing to address um, drug overdose fatalities, um, as well as some ideas for strategies that we really should be considering to try and confront this public health crisis um, in a different video, and I've also linked that below. And so anyways, th that's the sort of landscape of the motivations driving this desire to identify new, more effective, and safer treatments for pain. And so 
There have been multiple strategies that have been pursued over the years, from exploring completely unrelated families of drugs that have zero interaction with opioid receptors. Like one of my favorites was the capsaicin, was the pursuit of capsaicin, which is the molecule that sort of delivers the spiciness in uh, jalapenos and habaneros and the infamous California Reaper, a pepper that's so spicy that it seems to be giving everybody the finger. <laughs> um, but so, so that's the California Reaper. But so um, other projects have been to see if the opioids that are currently being used might be able to be combined with other substances, non-opioids, um, that make the pain-killing effects um, for opioids more effective at lower doses. And this is actually proven to be somewhat effective, but you know, fundamentally, treatments still rely upon the pharmacology of opioids. And so, you know, there's been a sustained interest in um, the ability of cannabinoids to perhaps offer, offer alternatives um, for people who are confronting more low to reasonably moderate chronic pain. And there's definitely been some indications that, that they do seem to be effective for some people. And this would include both THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, um, <clears throat> uh, which is the main sort of psychoactive agent in cannabis, as well as CBD, cannabidiol, uh, more recently. But, you know, the currently available studies suggest that they're only really moderately effective and actually ineffective or even potentially counterproductive in some people. So definitely helpful, um, definitely important tools, but also not an optimal solution, you know, to the main problem facing the use of opioids to treat pain. Okay, so there are other efforts, you know, in neuropharmacology, you know, just to be clear. But one of them that stuck out to me um, recently <clears throat> was a paper that was published four days ago, or I guess five days ago, that um, strikes, that, that, that makes some progress on an effort, um, on this effort to, to generate new uh, medications. And it strikes me as interesting. And it doesn't seem like it's actually gotten as much attention as I feel like it might warrant. So just right at the start, you know, to be clear, this is very preliminary research. This is about as early as it gets when it comes to the development of new medications in general, particularly medications that interact with the brain. But this is absolutely the way that we're going to get to the point of having new medications, you know, in physicians' hands. Because designing medications that target the most, you know, complicated part of our body, right, our nervous system, it still requires some really basic knowledge. And that knowledge is some of the hardest to pursue in biology. Um, and so these are some pretty nitty gritty studies, <clears throat> but, but, but it, it's, it's a trajectory of work that's interesting and, and I think exciting. So this is from a group out of Luxembourg, uh, which for anybody who's unfamiliar is a teeny tiny little country between Germany and France. <laughs> um, and so my American tongue is uh, insufficiently nimble to even try to pronounce the names um, of the scientists who contributed to these studies, uh, which you can see here. But the group identified um, <clears throat> Excuse me. The group identified a receptor that seems to play a role that was previously described actually in the cardiovascular system. So it's basically a receptor that can bind a molecule, usually a bunch of different molecules actually, <clears throat> not just one. And and the receptor sort of like distracts those molecules, right? The, the molecules are bound um, to these receptors, which are called scavenger receptors, and then as a result, they can't bind the receptors that they normally would have. Um, were it not for the scavenger receptors. So um, sort of like a decoy, right? And so this particular receptor that they've identified, um, ACKR3, unfortunately, uh, um, <clears throat> it's known to bind to a variety of signaling molecules, right? Not just opioids, uh, particularly in the immune system. And so in the study, the group published in 2020, um, which I believe, yeah, is the one on top, or I guess in the middle right there. The group demonstrated that, this group in Luxembourg, uh, demonstrated that this particular receptor exists in certain brain regions. Um, and those brain regions also host opioid receptors. And so in other words, and, and, and so, and it seems that they do bind opioids. And so, you know, in other words, the molecules that bind to our opioid receptors, right, um, you know, the neurotransmitters that bind to the, for example, the mu opioid receptor, they seem to bind this ACKR, ACKR3 receptor, okay? And so I know it's like impossible um, <laughs> to remember or maybe even deeply care about a name like ACKR3, <laughs> but you know, just think of it sort of as like a vacuum cleaner, right? It just sort of like prevents certain molecules from doing what they normally do, right, in the brain. And so imagine you're, you're, you're trying to empty the lint trap from your dryer or something, you know, a trash can or something, right? But somebody is aiming a vacuum cleaner directly at your hand, 
kind of a similar effect. You know, certain molecules just can't get to where they normally go without, um, you know, were it not for, for the scavenger receptor. So this group honed in on a molecule that they say is derived from the bark of a shrub called the pinwheel flower. A pretty little flower, um, or, or crepe jasmine, I believe is another name for it. And it seems to interact with this receptor, ACKR3. And so, you know, like any responsible lab would, you know, the press coverage of this publication emphasizes that the molecule they identified is natural. But, you know, they're essentially working, you know, um, th 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 there's really no, like, there's zero advantage or disadvantage to working with a molecule that's natural. Um, you know, there are plenty of natural molecules that will kill you or severely damage one of your organs, right? Particularly in fungi, by the way. But, but it's just one of those things that appeals to people, and so it's just sort of inevitable that a lab is going to do that. Anyways, um, you know, as I said uh, earlier, this publication um, uh, on which we're focusing today, this bottom one right here, <clears throat> it was published, you know, a few days ago. It's a follow-up to that initial publication about the, their scavenger receptor. Um, and that was published in 2020 um, when they identified this receptor in Nature Communications. Um, and by the way, that, that's an extremely prestigious journal to, to publish your work in. And so the molecule on which they're focusing, canolidine, I believe is, um, is how you pronounce that. I mean, don't worry about the name. It, it interacts with um, that receptor, right, that they identified in 2020, which again, you know, is that receptor that seems to kind of like sequester away various neurotransmitters and signaling molecules um, that are capable of interacting with opioid receptors. You know, a, you can also think of it as sort of like a volume knob, right? So, so it kind of turns down the volume on how loud, you know, the signal of these neurotransmitters can be. And so in the past, they had shown that drugs are capable um, or the drugs that are capable of, of activating the opioid scavenger receptor that they identified, um, which we call those agonists in the business, um, those molecules caused uh, reduced anxiety in mice. And so you might be wondering, how do you know if a mouse is anxious or isn't anxious, right? Totally reasonable and good question. Mice have almost all of the same types of brain structures that we have, but obviously, you know, quite a bit smaller and simpler. And so as a result, they can experience sort of like versions of the same states of consciousness that we do, but far simpler versions, right? With reduced, you know, variety and range. So, so you know, we have words, at least in English, I'm sure, you know, and, and many other languages, I'm um, sure more than, you know, I'm even familiar with. Um, you know, we have words to distinguish between, you know, happiness, contentedness, euphoria, joy, and, and so on, right? And you know, they're intended to identify emotional states that have quite a lot in common, of course, they're all positive, um, but, but they also, you know, there are subtle nuances that distinguish what it's like to experience them. And so for mice, they're capable of experiencing some version of that fundamental emotional state, but it's very likely that, you know, the distinctions between something like happiness and contentedness are just so incredibly subtle that they're really not even worth trying to distinguish, right, in a mouse. But when it comes to anxiety, mice, you know, just like humans, will tend to exhibit certain sets of behaviors, okay? And so if you think about the, the typical life of a mouse, which is essentially just trying to get food, trying to reproduce, and trying to not be eaten, right? Those anxiety-derived behaviors will tend to look a lot like they're trying to avoid being eaten. <laughs> and so if you've ever seen a mouse, you know, running around a city or, or maybe even in your house, you'll tend to see it run along a wall. Okay, rather than just like straight up walking around the middle of, of a room or a sidewalk, and if it, you know, uh, uh, moves across a sidewalk, it's moving, it's running, right? It's not just sort of meandering. Uh, that's a behavior called thigmataxis. But, um, you know, this isn't always what a mouse will do, but generally, you know, that's what they'll do, particularly when it's a brightly lit environment, okay? They're, they, that makes them extremely anxious. And they do that because they're anxious in open spaces with lots of light. And so it's, it's much easier for some, you know, predator to see them. If they're just sort of hanging out in the open with plenty of light to reveal where they are, you know, and some owl can like swoop down and gobble them up. And so, you know, that's just one example of anxiety associated behaviors that mice exhibit. But there are many versions of the same kind of thing. Um, and, you know, we know certain drugs very effectively reduce anxiety in humans, you know, think things like benzodiazepines, Xanax, and alprazolam, or Valium and Diazepam, as well as opioids. We know that these drugs tend to cause mice to not exhibit those anxiety behaviors. It's not super well established, 
But um, I'm sorry, it, it's it's super well established um, and, and highly replicable, right? And so you know, this was something that that I worked on in in my PhD, and uh, that thigmataxis behavior, that beha that tendency for mice to stick along to the edges of an environment rather than the middle. It always reminded me of like high school dances, where you know the the all of the the attend the people who were attending the dance who were super anxious, they didn't want to ask. They were anxious, too anxious to ask a girl, right, to, to dance or vice versa or whatever. Uh, they would, you know, stand along the sides of, of the dance floor. Anyways, yeah, so we exhibit thigmataxis in a way. So, um, so, and these are very well established, long established behaviors in mice. And so there's some evidence that if you give a mouse a molecule that's capable of activating this, this group, you know, this, this receptor that this group identified, this opioid scavenger receptor, mice will tend to be less anxious. And so this is a sign that, you know, not only does this receptor scavenge up opioid neurotransmitters, you know, that would normally bind opioid receptors, but by loading it up with various molecules that, that can bind it, you get similar reductions of anxiety, you know, that we see from typical opioids like morphine, heroin, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and so on, right? They all reduce anxiety. And so an important part of their story um, is, is that all of those classical opioids, again, you know, morphine, fentanyl, stuff like that, they don't seem to activate this scavenger receptor that they identified. Okay, so in other words, the, you know, all of those drugs, all those opioids don't interact with this receptor. And so, you know, importantly, all of the effects that they observed that this, you know, this, the molecules that interact with this receptor that are capable of binding it, they're resulting from interactions with other opioid receptors. Um, and so, you know, as a result, a drug that can interact with this receptor probably won't have, you know, all the same effects that those drugs do, morphine, oxycodone, and so on. But perhaps some of the effects that they do have, because it would be influencing how our own opioid neurotransmitters, the, the molecules that our nervous system produces that, you know, naturally or endogenous, endogenously bind the opioid receptors, you know, it, this scavenger receptor activating it influences um, you know how our own neurotransmitters function in our nervous system again sort of like you know adjusting the opioid neurotransmitter volume knob okay so so let's talk about another concept in neuropharmacology bias ligands <laughs> and i know it's it's some you know serious jargon but, but it, it is a simple concept i promise so first ligand just means a molecule that can bind a receptor that's it it's frustrating i know for our purposes you can just think of it as a biased drug right bias ligand just bias drug but you know just imagine that that my you know my fist is a receptor an opioid receptor and then my index finger is oxycodone or morphine right and so when it hits my middle finger knuckle when it binds a receptor you know um that that's oxycodone binding the opioid receptor so once the drug binds a receptor a whole bunch of things happen right those those are my fingers you know five different things happen um it, that's not actually what happens when the mu opioid receptor is bound, but you can think of it that way. It's not just one thing that happens as a consequence of you know, receptor binding, a bunch of things happen, okay? So some of those things are things you'll want, like killing pain, right? <laughs> um, but some of those things are effects you don't want, right? You know, suppressing the ability to breathe or causing tolerance and addiction and, and stuff like that, right? So the concept behind a, a biased ligand or biased drug is that, you know, when, you know, my, my my index finger, right, or, or let's use a different finger, that when this, this drug binds the same receptor, you still get some effects, but only some of those uh, effects, not all of them. And so, you know, hopefully you'll get the ones that, you know, the, or the, the ones that you do get are the things that you want, and the ones that you don't get are the things you don't want. Again, things like suppressed respiration, rapid tolerance, even itchiness, and that kind of stuff, right? So, so that's what a biased ligand does. You're activating receptor in a very controlled way. You know, you're holding its hand rather than like hugging it. <laughs> and so that whole approach to developing new painkillers was, and I think it's fair to say, was like the approach to developing new painkillers that had emerged as perhaps the most promising strategy over the years. And just last year, a medication uh, that was developed according to this strategy, a biased ligand, biased drug, was approved by the FDA. Just last year, Olaceridine. Okay, so olaceridine binds the same exact receptor that morphine, oxycodone, fentanyl all bind. But it does it in a way that seems to avoid some of the effects that these you know, older drugs have. But at least um, at the moment, it's unfortunately only used intravenously, right? So you have to have like an IV or you know, it has to be injected in medical settings. 
um, and it's used to treat moderate to severe acute pain. Okay, so think surgery, right? But the clinical trials suggested that this drug, olaceridine, was just as effective as morphine for the treatment of pain following a surgery. But most importantly, for the whole biased drug, biased ligand, you know, strategy, it was also found to induce less respiratory depression compared to morphine, right? So in other words, it looks like this drug may kill pain just as effectively as morphine, but it may not also have that baggage of potentially causing people to stop breathing, or at least not as heavy baggage, um, right? Not as much baggage as other opioids. It doesn't suppress your breathing as much. And this was true even when olaceridine was combined with other opioids. Pretty cool, right? And so, um, so I've linked the study that, that you know, demonstrated olaceridine um, in the discussion or the description section. So that's super exciting and, and hopefully you know, we'll start to yield a wider variety of alternative painkillers that can be used in, in ways beyond just like intravenous and in clinical settings. But that's not even, it's just, it's exciting, but it's not even the main thing I wanted to talk about today. So let's go back to canolidine, okay? That, that molecule derived from the pinwheel flower. So the authors note that this flower has, quote, long been used in traditional Chinese, Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic, and Thai medicines to treat fever and pain. Pretty interesting. And pharmacologists were only recently able to perform the chemistry you know, necessary to identify this specific molecule that seems to have been useful in this plant. So it turns out that canolidine, um, you know, that molecule from the pinula flower, it appears to have some real pain-killing effects, you know, what we call analgesia in the business. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it seems to have pain-killing effects, including pain that's, that's induced by inflammation. So, think arthritis. But, you know, while the molecule was shown, was shown to be able to get into the brain, it doesn't appear to interact with the standard opioid receptors, right? The types, again, the types of receptors that morphine, oxycodone bind. And past studies have shown that this drug is capable of interacting with a bunch of other neurotransmitter receptors and transport of proteins, things like serotonin receptors and norepinephrine transporters, but not very intensely, right? So with low affinity. So, so th those receptors, those targets, those, you know, um, serotonin receptors and so on probably aren't mediating the effects that they observed. But guess which receptor conolidine does bind? that very opioid receptor that this group in Luxembourg characterized last year. So we have a drug that does not bind the receptors that drugs like morphine, heroin, oxycodone, fentanyl bind, but does bind the opioid scavenger receptor. So why should we be excited about this? Well, we already know that it has some analgesic pain killing effects, right? We already know that. We know a fair bit about um, the, the receptor that it binds, um, and so therefore we have a pretty good idea of how it might be delivering those pain-killing effects. And since it doesn't bind the same receptors that dr a drug like fentanyl binds, the mu opioid receptor, it'll be pretty unlikely to have at least all of the same effects that a drug like fentanyl and morphine will have, right? Um, and so, you know, um, what it likely does is just enable the opioids that our nervous system, you know, produces, or, or let's call them natural, endogenous uh, opioid neurotransmitters, it probably enables those neurotransmitters to sort of linger around a little bit more, you know, enabling them to bind our opioid receptors more in a way that's kind of, sort of similar to how an SSRI, right, think, you know, fluoxetine, Prozac, how those medications enable serotonin molecules to reach slightly higher levels in the brain, right? SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and they're frequently the frontline treatment for, or at least medication, for um, depression. And so, just to be clear, like, I kind of doubt that canolidine itself, that molecule, will be the specific molecule that's used in a new pain-killing medication that's hopefully safer than, um, than the, the sort of standard armamentarium of opioids, uh, the, the you know, repertoire of opioids that, that physicians have today. I kind of doubt that it's going to be canolidine, but, um, but it, it may, and it's totally possible that it may. Rather, it's, it's sort of a clue, right? A starting point for neuropharmacologists and medicinal chemists to begin tweaking the molecule here and there, the canolidine molecule. Right, developing new molecules that are even more effective than canolidine, much like the efforts that went into developing that biased ligand, right, olaceridine. Uh, you know, that's the drug that does bind the same receptor that um, morphine and fentanyl bind, but only produces some of the effects that morphine and fentanyl induce, right? In other words, so this team seems to have discovered a new way for us to attack pain 
right? Chronic pain, inflammation, or inflammatory, uh, inflammation-associated pain, and maybe even other sources of pain. And that it doesn't uh, involve the same exact strategy that's been used for decades and decades. Right or the same drugs that have been, you know, driving this giant, unprecedented surge in individuals who've been lost to drug overdose fatalities. So this is really, really good news. All right, that's what I have for you today. Um, thanks for checking it out. Um, and if you enjoy neuropharmacology or talking about it, or learning about it, uh, or neuroscience consciousness, uh, maybe you'll consider subscribing, uh, uh, liking the stream. Otherwise, I will see you next week. See everybody.